The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with each of you now and always. Amen. In the 1960s, there was a phenomenon that began called free love. Now, admittedly, the title actually only came about because free love, or what it described, has actually been around since the beginning of time. Free love was a movement in our country, around the world it seemed, of a more open response to the intimate relationship that was intended to be shared in the marriage between husband and wife. This openness brought about a change in people's thinking, a change in the way they viewed that relationship that was designed for husband and wife. It brought about a more open response, an idea that people could, as a woman, could go and be with another man, even if she was not married, or a man with a woman who he was not intending to marry without supposed repercussions. This is nothing new, though. In fact, as I said, this has been around since the beginning of time. This desire to love and to love one and to be loved by others has been around since Adam and Eve. And it's also been a problem since the fall into sin. As our epistle lesson reminds us today, Paul's warning is, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body. But he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Paul was addressing the people of Corinth. He first starts off addressing one of their sarcastic remarks that all things are legal for them. They believed that because they'd been redeemed, because they'd received the gospel, that they could live a licentious lifestyle. That they could live a lifestyle that did not obey God's design for marriage. They believed that they could have an open relationship with whomever they would like. Now this is a bit of an uncomfortable topic for us in church. In fact, to those who are a bit more pious probably remember times when this is something we would have skated over. But we live in a society that is very open about it. We live in a society that does not treat that three-letter word as a swear word, but is very, in everything we look at, talks about it. And so if we ignore it in the church as well, we ignore the opportunity to talk about God's design for marriage. We ignore the opportunity to talk about the gift that God has given us in marriage of that intimate relationship shared between a husband and a wife. Jesus reinforces that it is between two, but the two becoming one flesh. That God said in Genesis chapter 2, He reinforces it in Matthew 19 when He says, At the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they know are, are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Here Jesus affirms that beautiful intimacy that comes only in marriage. Here Jesus reinforces what it, what it is intended for. The marriage bed. That marriage relationship. It is not intended to be open and shared as popular media would suggest. It is not intended to be a passing fad with whomever you meet, whomever you fall in love with. But the marriage relationship, that intimate bond between husband and wife is intended to be shared as a lifelong gift from God. And I'd like to focus a little bit on those gifts today. Because too often, we do focus on the negatives. We focus on the law. And the sin. And there is that law out there. But I'd like to focus on that gift of that intimate relationship between husband and wife. And that gift, first of all, starts out from God as a way to quench our passions. I don't think I need to tell any of you what it means to burn with passion. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, if they cannot control themselves, they should marry. For it is better to marry than burn with passion. All of you have gone through Times in your life where you have burned with passions. I don't think that you stop burning with passion at the age of 30 either. But burning with passion is something we've experienced. We understand. And as you go through life, we know that what is around us suggests ways, other ways than God has designed to quench those passions. What is around us has suggested in our society that we quench those passions with whoever will fit the bill at that minute. There's even songs that say, if you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with. I thought many of you knew that song. It's a little older. 
But that message is kind of, it's kind of a sad message, isn't it? Because that's not what God says at all. You know, instead, be with the one you love. Be with that person because that intimate relationship is an important thing. That intimate relationship, there is a cost to it when it is shared outside of marriage. That intimate relationship, when it is spoiled by outside sources, it takes away from the beauty, the joy of that intimacy shared between one man and one woman. The one flesh relationship. And perhaps one of the most insidious interruptions to marriage today, the most insidious and maybe veiled threats is pornography. I'm sure it would not surprise many of you to hear that in past studies, nearly 50% of all men have or will look at pornography. In recent studies, this number has jumped to 70% for males between 18 to 34. And if you're looking at it and saying, wow, that's a lot, Females, 33% of females will look at pornography at some time in their life. Pornography has entered into our culture, and it has taken and it has robbed many marriages of that intimacy shared between two people. It, the devil sneaks it in and says it is nothing. It is simple paper. It is simple movies. But it is not. Because one of the problems with pornography is not only does it separate you from only your wife or only your husband, but it also encourages you to objectify people. That is, to look at a man or a woman and see them as an object rather than seeing them as a unique gift from God. Not only that, but pornography, it seems to be this thing that our culture shrugs off. It seems to be something that we say, well, it's nothing to it. It's not really cheating, but it opens the door. In fact, as we look at studies done on those who have struggled with a pornography addiction, we see that not only do, is there a physical, emotional addiction, but there's a physical addiction as well. The brain changes much like in a drug and an alcohol, someone who's addicted to drugs and alcohol, the brain also changes in addiction towards pornography. And so this is not something simple. This is not something that's just in the brown paper bag and not talked about anymore. But it is something that has infected many marriages and destroyed many marriages. God desires that the marriage bed be pure. He says pure and blameless, spotless. It is not to be shared with people, objects, paper, videos, but he's shared between a husband and a wife. And in that sharing, God blesses the husband and the wife together. In that sharing, God works through that marriage to bring greater joy and love for one another. Because there is no relationship like the re marital relationship. There is no intimacy like the intimate relationship that a husband and wife share. That intimacy can only be shared in, in that act of love. And that intimacy, it show, it's, it's not only meant to quench our passions, to put water on those burning passions, but it's also meant to bring us joy. Emotional joy, physical joy. God did not give us a life here on earth. Give us a husband or a wife just so that we could stand there and get along, but He gave us one another to build each other up, to share joy with one another, to share love with one another, to build up one another. And it doesn't matter how long you've been married either. It doesn't mar matter if you've been married one year, five years, ten years, thirty years, fifty years. God continues to put pleasure, to build that pleasure between husband and wife, that love between husband and wife when the marriage bed is kept pure. And in fact, we have further encouragement in Ecclesiastes where we see the where we <coughs> where we hear Solomon write, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three stands is not quickly broken. And when we look at that uniting, 
Christ at the center of every marriage, that one flesh relationship, we see that most abundant gift. We see how it blossoms and how it grows. We see how that gift can be used to bring glory to God. Sometimes we get caught up in the law. We get caught up in the fact that there's so many lists of things to do in the Bible. Those Ten Commandments seem like like an ongoing list, but God also desires our pleasure in this life. He didn't, he didn't create the law just to, keep, just to make us go through hoops, but to, so that we could find that true pleasure, that true joy in knowing Him. And sometimes you hear married couples kind of jokingly say this, hopefully, but sometimes in a serious way, my old ball and chain. And while this doesn't deal directly with the intimacy of the intimate relationship of marriage, I think this is something that also needs to be addressed. Because it is not our old ball and chain. That person, your husband, your wife, is a gift from God. And sometimes that person changes. That person's not going to be the person they were that that spark ignited for maybe 20 years ago. But that person is still God's gift to you. God's gift to you to, 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 to find blessing and joy, to bless one another, to lift up one another. And so uh, that person should be lifted up in your prayers. God blesses uh, that intimate relationship in marriage in another way. Not every time, but oftentimes with procreation, with children. There is the, when we look at other species in the world, they procreate to continue their, to simply keep their species going. However, God has blessed us as part of the creative process. When, we, when the two become one flesh, when they make a child together, it is an ongoing her- heritage. It is, a, it is someone who is molded, just as we were molded in God's image. We mold that child or those children in God's image. And God has invited us to be part of that. God has invited us to be part of raising children. And as I said, sometimes as they are a gift, not everybody receives the gift of children. Or at least not in the way that we expect. But that each child is a gift from God. A unique and a wonderful gift. To be molded. To see the love of God. To be raised in the church. To be raised up. To know the forgiveness of God. Now as marriage is a gift, Not everybody receives the gift of marriage. But there's another gift that Paul references in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And that is the gift of celibacy. Now this gift, sometimes in our culture and in other cultures, it it seems like we try to push people to get married. We try to push them into marriage when they're not ready, just because it may be awkward or wrong when they're not married. But God also has blessed us with that gift of celibacy. And in fact... Sometimes it's, it is a gift that is greater from the standpoint that someone who is celibate, someone who, who is able to devote more time in their life to God and the study of His Word, to the directions and paths He has for His life. So being celibate, being single is not a curse from God. It is not something that should be looked down upon. But as, as it is in the history been lifted up, we should lift it up as well. Now there are those who cannot control their passions those who burn with those passions. And they should be married as, are, as they are encouraged by Paul. But, but if you are able to be celibate, to remain as an individual, then God works in a unique way to speak to your life, to work through His Gospel. And why is it so important that we understand marriage and this gift of God's intimacy Why is it so important that we understand that it needs to remain pure? Well, first of all, we need to know this not only for our own selves, for the sake of our bodies, for the sake of our emotions, because there is every time a cost. Every time we are physically intimate with someone else, there is a cost. But also because it is an image that God has designed between Him and the church. And what comes to my mind first, of course, is Ephesians chapter 5. But there's also a book in the Old Testament that, well, I don't know if we ever read it as part of of our uh, pericope system, but the book of the Song of Solomon. 
The book of Song of Solomon is one of the most graphic books in the Bible describing the sexual relationship. Not of a man and a woman though, but God's love for His creation. God's love for His people. God's love for us is so intimate that He would compare it to that intimacy between husband and wife. Now on this earth, our love is imperfect. It is stained by sin. It is polluted by the devil. See, the devil twists and he turns these good things God has created us. But when we see God's intimate love for us, we see it in perfection when He goes to the cross. When He gives the price of the sacrifice, His own blood, we see the perfection of His love. When He gives His own life for each one of us. And so even when we fail, when we fail to be the perfect temple for the Holy Spirit, even when we fail and we don't always remain pure and chaste, our Lord, He went to the cross and He still forgives us. For there is no sin that is outside the forgiveness of our Lord. There is no sin that is outside of the power of His love. For His love, it goes deeper than we could ever imagine. His love is everlasting. And His love He has shown to us in His care and kindness through that sacrifice of Christ. And so whether you are married or unmarried, whether you are single or widowed, or a widower, God shows us His love. He shows us that gift of His gracious love each and every day and each and every time we come to Him. He comes to us in a very real way. And that is in the Lord's Supper. He comes to us and He communes with us. That word communion. We use it so often, but do we always think about what it means? When we commune with God, He is literally dwelling with us. Dwelling with us in His great love. And so each and every day, we see that gift of God's love. We see His forgiveness. And He encourages us to see each of His gifts of love, whether single or married. And so, as you look forward, as you go forth in this life, as you consider where you are in your marriage or in your relationship, I encourage you to seek out God's design for marriage. God's design for your life. Because it doesn't matter how young or how old you are. Because it doesn't change. Our God is unchanging and He is perfect. And His design for marriage didn't stop when Scriptures were closed. But His design for marriage continues to reach on to today. His design for marriage continues to give us the promise. The promise that we will have that great joy. Now some of you, some of you have lost your spouses. And that is a traumatic thing. Perhaps more traumatic than many other ways because of that intimate relationship. But we also have that promise of Christ. That one day, we will be reunited in His presence. We will be reunited as the bride to His bridegroom in the great joy of salvation. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, we give You thanks and praise for those in our lives that You have blessed us with. We thank You, Lord, for those who are married, for the blessing of the marriage bed and the bonds that You have, cre that you have given them. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to bless them and continue to, that, to, to draw them together, strengthened by you. Lord, we pray that you would continue to be with those who are single, those who are widowed or widowers, that you would strengthen their love for you, strengthen their relationship with you, that they may ever know your presence, that they may seek your word and find guidance. And Lord, may we, as your people, always know your presence and know the abundance of your love. And never stop seeking that, that gift of your love to each one of us. This we pray through Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen.